can do is you can inject PSL over the membrane and then do the peeling also. That not only prevents the bleeding by the pressure over the uh, the uh, the PSL pressure over the membranes, but also somehow you can also remove those membranes with the help of ILM forceps. So as I mentioned in the last slide, you can also remove some very taut membranes which are adherent to the retina under PFCL. But you have to be very careful. You have to have good experience and the pressure should be tangential yes. and be very slow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. One. Thank Anybody you. else Thank you, sir. has questions? Okay. Sir, sir. Uh, so you can come late. Last no, sir. That okay. Um, I think there's something missing. Just check it. Greeting. Sweet dude. I think I'm missing your slides, probably. Jam, please. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, so, Dr. Ashok Sharma is going to present endosaver assisted ultra thin DAC. Uh, this one is okay. This patient had uh, pseudophagic corneal edema and uh, we had to do dissect for him. We are doing now the epithelial. The same at Orexis was performed using a Sinsky's hook. The main incision was enlarged. Endosaver is similar to an IOL injector. It has a plate to place the donor tissue with endothelium side up and two buttons. The loading of the tissue is done by rotating the proximal button loading. The insertion is done by rotating the distal button. Air bubbles are injected into the anterior chamber. This patient with had rheumatoid arthritis and severe dry eye and was successfully rehabilitated with this procedure. My most valuable tip is that the endosaver assisted DSAEK is easy to muster, delivers the donor lenticule traumatically, and causes the least endothelial cell loss. Thank you. Thank you for hearing. Y your comments, please. Okay. So you can use it only once? No, no. This is single use. A single use? No? Single use. Huh. A single use or yeah. What is the what is the lenticular thickness? Sir? We, it, it's less than hundred, sir. And some in some cases we have used seventy four microns up to seventy microns. And the beauty of the procedure is that after the surgery, within three months the lenticle further thins down, sir. So the ultra thin DSEC gives better visual results. And in some studies, it has been uh, like shown to give comparison, comparative results to DMAC, except for some advantages in contrast and uh, uh, some aberrations. So when you are taking it through into the endo saver, so do you take it without the saline or you use a saline or visco to uh, visco retract it into the used. injector? Uh, the loading of the, the, the beauty of this instrument is this lenticule with endosi endothelial side up. We just uh, wet this instrument and uh, in fact we have not been able to show on the full. It has got a, a tubing also which is connected to the uh, irrigation. So very little irrigation you can start. So you don't need the side port and you don't use viscoelastic in this one. It get, uh, once you like rotate the knob, it gets folded into the tube and you in, in, uh, inject into the anterior chamber. Automatically, your lenticle is inserted into the anterior chamber and you lose very little endothelial cells. I have patients for whom we have done for more than 12 years DSEC with this instrument and the graphs are still clear.
What is so, new in this? What is the? What is novice or what is new in this? Uh, <laughs> what what is uh, new is that uh, uh, like uh, this instrument uh, should be used and those who are starting this procedure if they have access to this instrument they will be very comfortable in the initial phases because all of us who have who are doing this we all started with the forceps which is totally uh, which is more traumatic to the endothelial cells and are difficult to manage by manual technique yeah by manual tech and then using glide you need by manual technique quite extensive and uh, you have to cross whole of your anterior chamber then cross the uh, come to the 12 o'clock position hold the lenticule and then insert it so this one is quite uh, like uh, learning curve is very little and uh, uh, it's a, a great instrument only thing is uh, single use little cost is being added uh, this is a like an iol injector yeah this is i like iol like that's that. what i i'm saying that everyone is familiar with that and, and you feel more comfortable what is the material of the plunger it's not going to get engaged between no no sir it's it's a it's a plate only and gets converted into the tube once you inject the tube uh, is uh, it it the tube retracts and delivers the lenticule atraumatically in the anterior chamber and then you withdraw it you don't have to enlarge the incision also this is less than 4 mm incision you can use this instrument mm -hmm. okay replacement of busen glide uh but uh, that's true sir uh, busen glide single time investment quite heavy but this one recurrent and very uh, i think uh, if if we are performing dsec uh, uh, this cost is not that much what is the cost so around 15000 Uh, suppose you use the uh i'm not very familiar with that sir Because and do the dmac injection dmac is different sir uh, we are dmac may be possible sir dsec will not be possible dsec i don't think will be possible uh, dmac okay <laughs> uh, to think so the problem is once the tissue is crushed then uh, the purpose of the surgery is gone that's a problem otherwise we can fold it like a lachhedar prontha and insert <laughs> it and get away with the cost nice Thank technique you, sir good so the next speaker is dr arun kumar jain i'm sorry sir there's some uh, one thing went wrong with copying uh, all right it's okay a post traumatic toric icl i have no financial disclosures a 29 year old male presented to us with complaints of glare and difficulty to open eyes in 6 months it was tetus post blunt trauma patient has a history of both a toric icl implantation in 2019 for high refractive error so on the day of presentation on ocular examination we found that the visual acuity was minus 0.5 spherical and minus 1.5 cylinder in the right eye with 69 vision and iop was normal on anterior segment examination we found that the cornea was clear but the pupil was peaked at 8 o'clock with haptic in ac and now our management plan was to reposit the icl we had to ensure that when we reposit we reposit in the same axis of 16 degree as it was originally done during the surgery in 2019 so after icl repositioning on post operative day 1 we found that the best correct visual acuity was 69 rp was normal but on anterior segment examination we found that the iris is atrophic and retracted at 8 o'clock with asocity and we found there was a high wall centrally as well as in the peripheral area where the pupil was atrophic so now the patient has a atrophic iris patient still has complaints of glare and a high asymmetric wall so our plan was single pass four throw pupilloplasty in this technique before we give the peribulbar anesthesia we mark the visual axis as well as we mark the axis of astigmatism of 16 degree now the convention steps of single pass four throw pupilloplasty is performed the incisions are made a single pass of needle is done through the edges of the iris defect the suture end is then passed through the loop with the four throws as conventionally described and the knot is then tied after one week post pupilloplasty we found that the patient has best corrected visual acuity of 6x parts and the pupil is now round and regular on asocity the wall got reduced and patient symptoms got resolved take home messages that to uh, educate the patients report early in case of any complication no arun sir 
nice techniques are uh, <laughs> really hats off to you to have the courage of you know doing it in a icl case ICL. you know mild uh, sub micron level <clears throat> many you are you know you can go either ways uh, the only question i have is uh, is was there any pinhole pupil effect sir after that uh, no the pupil uh, we dilated the pupil also you can uh, it becomes no we can dilate it but on the refraction was there any pinhole effect uh, on the refraction of no, the no because the pupil size in either of the eyes will vary isn't it now this was first day because it was a little bit pilocarpenized <laughs> but it uh, increased to 3 to 4 mm later on okay. and uh, because the shorter of time we didn't put the eye trace graphs of quality of vision before and after okay they were two way different okay. lot of aberrations in uh, uh, before sft and compared to post sft and uh, though you said uh, clearly it's a very difficult situation if you go heva you can create cataract yeah, you can in create this, uh, yeah. uh, in uh, this case so it was quite satisfying for the patient in terms of glare visual acuity and we advise the patient they should come early he waited yeah, yeah. for 6 right. months at home so rs became atrophic uh, we try to Uh, center it in the first surgery when we aligned the eye well and put the haptic back but uh, the bleeding started so we didn't do it at that time we tried to do a visco dissection at that time the pilo cap and we tried to constrict it but it was atrophic as you can see the pupillary rough is also absent in that area so uh, it was uh, there is no case of i tried to search the literature Yeah, there is no, no case issue. report of doing sft in a case of icl as such so we advise patient they should come early if they don't come early and in this case uh, special thing is you have to mark the visual axis before giving peribulbar because you are handling rs this is painful uh, and you are passing two sutures and uh, if patient is moving you can hit the lens so you have first to mark the Center. visual axis not the center not the pupillary axis the visual axis coaxially sighted central corneal reflex and first we mark also the axis of the orientation of the icl also mm-hmm. by very yeah, this was my very second on. question to yeah, you yeah. <laughs> so because, because the toric icl yeah toric it was a toric icl so before giving icl we pay, let the patient lie down hmm. we had the uh, varion data from the varion we with the varion we mark the axis at 16 degree then mark the coaxially sighted central uh, visual axis reflex and then gave peribulbar and then planned our suture in such a way that pupil centers onto the visual axis rather than pupillary axis otherwise you will have a, a, a less than <coughs> cord mu should be taken care into cord mu yeah angle yeah, alpha that. kappa so this was in the horizontal axis in the uh, the pe- peaking of pupil uh, was in the this horizontal. was at around 730 to 8 o'clock meridian 732 that's why uh, if it would have been uh, in a superior part under the lid upper lid then we could have left it like that it all depends upon the quality of vision if it doesn't affect the quality of vision then you can leave it like that hmm. but the vault was also asymmetric though the pupil became little bit atrophic and floppy in that meridian so the vault was little higher on that side as compared to the other side okay. that's why we got a little astigmatism mm. before first surgery uh, post operatively we didn't have any astigmatism okay. because the asymmetric vault and a little tilt of the icl that. we had a uh, astigmatism also yeah uh, this was i think after the uh, the procedure it was 0.5 diopters yeah. only yeah. and before it was yeah, uh, yeah. 1.5 it was much more Very nice. So we took What the, viscoelastic did you use? So in this case, we used the helon plane. We okay. injected okay. behind the iris and in front of the iris so that you have a space to work. Okay. Otherwise, you will be hitting the ICL, ICL or the lens or otherwise. You have to create a space. Behind. But yeah. already the space is less in most ICL cases. Yeah, but it's cases. a very large myopic eye, 27, okay, so 13 the, diopter of refractive error, deep. deep uh, ac all those things yeah very nice very, very nicely managed very sir nicely managed. superb thank you thank you sir so just moving and uh, dr arthi is here
Dr. Arthi, you can come. She is going to present a rare case of traumatic attack. What it taught me. We call them nuns. We call them warriors. Some call them dads. We call them the next generation of that. A rare case of traumatic cataract, what it taught me. 26 year old male presented with rapid onset decrease in vision. On examination, patient had self sealed corneal wound, iron foreign body on the lens, anterior capsular tear with a mature cataract. Two side ports were fashioned and the anterior capsule was stained with trypan blue dye. Here you can see the Argentina flag sign very clearly. Main port was made and the intraocular iron foreign body was removed. Phaco emulsification was then commenced using low parameters. Viscoelastic was injected in the anterior chamber before removing the phaco probe. After assessing the extent of the Argentina flag sign, the capsulotomy was attempted in order to have a circular opening. Single piece intraocular lens was injected in the bag and the case was concluded. Postoperatively, patient did very well with visual acuity of 6 by 9. Some take home points. High degree of suspicion irrespective of the allied history presented by the patient. Posterior segment involvement to be ruled out. Stain the capsule for better visualization. Low parameter FACO to prevent high octane trauma. Not to let the anterior chamber to collapse suddenly. Last but not the least. Keep your fingers crossed and hope for a good outcome. So keeping the theme of the session, uh, I chose the case that taught me maximum so that I can give the take home points. The uh, PC was intact in this one. Yes. Yeah. There was something on the PC. Are you sure there was no uh, foreign body that went uh, through it? No, ma'am. Something on the PC, it was like a cruciate... Uh, that was the that was the corneal wound wound of entry which was self sealed. Yeah, uh, that was in the anterior. Uh, so how you made sure that the PC is not involved? In this the tear is not extended to PC. Sir, we did the B scan and we did the CT scan as well to see right. to locate any other foreign body. So you put a suture on the cornea also? No, it, that was self-sealed, sir. You checked it, uh, sedal sign? Was yes, sir. The negative. patient presented after 15 days and he presented because of the cataract. He did not even remember that something went in the eye. So his presenting complaints were uh, diminution of vision. This was a metallic foreign body? Yes, sir. What was the occupation? He was a vendor. Yeah, I mean, it was occupational injury, definitely. How did the flag sign happen? I mean, he just entered the anterior chamber no, it was already there. Already. So, on uh, when the, the patient body, presented to us, by the foreign body which has went inside. No, sir. No, no, it was there before. But how can you have it when uh, the lens was not in cataract? This lens, lens, was no, the foreign body when it entered, the lens would not have been cataract, right? The foreign body caused the cataract. So, the foreign body ruptured. was uh, ruptured, has ruptured the anterior, anterior lens capsule. capsule. But, uh, the intralentical pressure should have been high. Yeah, and later. probably happened spontaneously. Yeah. Later so, it must have happened spontaneously. Yeah, Over that is the possibility. We can keep that because the patient did not present on the day one. He presented after 15 days and his main complaint was blurred vision. And he has no idea about the foreign body. Absolutely no signs. No signs. The only presenting complaint was blurred vision. Why the the yes, sir. Afterwards, I thought that putting the lens will be easy if I have uh, like little space to work over there and the rexes will be round, so it will be easy. Well done, Kesarthi. Uh, the only thing which I will add on is we would have 
preferred a three piece lens instead of a single piece yeah. sir i was operating <laughs> this patient in the uh, country where uh, i was not able to get the three piece lens oh. and i could not postpone the surgery for that no, no, well done <laughs> good what is that the yeah the idea stability of that lens is more in such cases actually not in time so foreign body in a foreign land hmm? that should be the take home <laughs> <laughs> with a foreign surgeon <laughs> nicely done thank, thank you, you so much sir so our next presenter is dr gs dhami he is going to speak on managing intraoperative floppy iris with dhami's vice shipper vice shipper chopper Why sh shipper and chopper? I yeah. We describe a novel instrument designed by the author that combines two mechanisms: one iris stretching rod on its one side, and two a curved chopper on the other end. We describe our initial experience with this instrument across a spectrum of small pupil management and eyes with intraoperative meiosis. This is a cataract surgery being performed in grade 4 after completing a capsulohexis. We observe intraoperative meiosis and floppy iris prolapse in main wound. Using vascoelastic, we refill the anterior chamber and retract the prolapsed iris from the wounds. We switch from the routine chopper to the DYSC and with it we are able to push back the iris and simultaneously we are able to emulsify the nuclear fragments using the chopper end into multiple pieces and completing a surgery without any complications. This is a case of a moderate small pupil less than 5 mm which after performing capsulohexis becomes smaller and with the help of the Y shaper chopper we are able to push the iris in the periphery allowing easier nuclear piece hold and emulsification. does it make a little more uh, bulky or it's like any chopper but question is what is available to you immediately while you are operating a hook a ring or visco dilatation which will just come out moment you enter the ac again so this is lying in your tray routinely and once you once in a time you face intraoperative meiosis which is very common floppy iris is very common and without disturbing the structure of the iris you are just avoiding it pushing the nuclear fragment forwards holding it and while holding it chopping with the chopper it's a very light instrument it's just like a weight of a sinski hook any question from the audience excellent very nice innovation thank sir you. and thank, uh, you. thank you for publishing it nijo as well <laughs> yeah. thank you yeah. because that's the only way you know otherwise you rush in the ot yes i want hooks give me that so that anxiety acts my, to the my surgeon. only anxiety or not anxiety my only question here is sir does the iris becomes even more floppy when you touch it with the yes. instrument uh, uh, the my first point was we are avoiding the iris yes. to be sucked in by the phaco tip okay and then pushing with the chopper the fragment into the phaco tip hmm. it's more of creating a space between the fragment and the phaco tip and vacuum yeah and thereby provide like a mechanical mechanical dilatation mechanical. Yeah, mechanical. thank you so much sir lovely innovation actually and you have some session or some over level you got okay okay so we'll try to adjust you that may be the that may be the i think better option uh, no problem we'll continue till then so next the speaker is dr uh, presenter uh, should, i should say dr hrdeya mohan 
she is going to speak on ex extended tunnel cataract surgery in case of triple trouble extended tunnel cataract surgery in cases of triple trouble Severe microcornea iris colobum and dense cataract can be surgeon's nightmare. What are my surgical options? FACO is associated with increased risk of zonular stress and endothelial damage due to ultrasound energy. SICS can cause dissonant detachment due to large nucleus and small tunnel. And ECC has issues with wound deposition. So came the idea of extended tunnel cataract surgery. It's a modification of small incision cataract surgery in which the scleral incision and this little tunnel made is an extended one, extending beyond the margins of microcornea. Side pockets are made generously. Side boot is made and trepan loo is injected. The keratome entry is made in such a way that the entry corresponds well to the external incision. Iris hooks were placed for better pupillary dilatation. Plexus was initiated with a cystodome and continued with forcep. Multiple areas of anterior lens capsule calcification were encountered. Severe calcification areas were cut in a circular fashion with monastasis. Bulky nucleus is wheeled out into the anterior chamber using bimanual technique with adequate injection of viscoelastic substance. Iris hooks were removed and the bulky nucleus was delivered out using irrigating wire vectors, atraumatically and effortlessly. After cortex removal, IOL was placed. Sufficient wound deposition was attained with four interrupted sutures and the patient had a satisfactory visual outcome. Thank you. Sir, for this case, it was 7.5, sir. It was a microcornea. Microcornea, sir. Achha, this was a microcornea, less yes, than sir, 10 millimeter. Yeah, yes, sir. So the nucleus in these cases usually is quite thick, right? Yes, sir. So, um, this was like a clear tunnel as in SICS. Only thing was, it was little more clear. Yes, sir. It was bigger than, like, it was extending beyond the corneal margins. Yeah. So, so it was beyond the limbus. Yes, sir. The cornea and the sclera. Yes, sir. The valve effect is gone. But, uh, yeah. Give, uh, side, side cuts. Side cuts. Uh, sir, actually, I'd done uh, two more cases uh, where the corneal diameter was a little larger those cases i didn't need to suture at all it was forming with just uh, you know hydro anterior chamber was well formed yeah, even yeah, yeah. So the lens was much bigger than cornea size yeah because you know in these eyes you can't even go fake because if there deep exposure and yes sir it's very, very yes, challenging and in this particular case there was fibrosis of the capsule yes sir. capsule so we were not sure we that uh, this uh, capsular exit could have extended during yes the sir but one thing i would like to say is sir. Um, you did a, a capsular access uh, with a large incision yes what, sir. Uh, we recommend what i will feel myself is that if you do it with a smaller incision you get a better control and because the leakage of the anterior chamber is not there and you can do it in a better way that's what and uh, nice yes sir yes ma'am yes, ma okay. 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 that's a bisection yeah, 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 yes. and uh, <coughs> It's difficult, but they yeah. should be present now. I was more concerned about the cornea. I think there's hardly any space. The chamber is too small. And cornea, I was worried about the cornea. Is an issue, no? yeah. That time, uh, all of us, whether we have it. So, oh, uh, yeah, that. I think it's well managed. Yes, thank you, sir.
No, not like that. SICS is a good option. Uh, the only thing is that whenever the uh, uh, scleral tunnel goes beyond corneal margins, you have to be very careful. Yes, sir. And uh, the snaring technique, as Madam rightly said, you could have done it. That is one of the techniques. The third thing is that don't keep the incision open for a very long time. The eyes are prone for other complications like supracorridals and all. So yes. you have to keep so many things in mind. We have seen a couple of patients who have just gone into super, then you cannot do anything. Okay. So be a little careful on that and a good block should be there. Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you thank you so much. So <clears throat> next is Dr. Granji Singh. He couldn't make it. So this will not be, uh, marks will not be given in this one. But I'll play the video anyhow. The way a four-wheeler is more safe than a two-wheeler, similarly, a four-claw RS claw lens is much more safe than a two-claw lens, which was basically designed by Dr. Janwurst, and we have modified into a four-claw. Let's see its application in one of the cases. This is a case of subluxated RS claw lens, which was primarily done as a secondary case around 30 years back in a case with a large RS coloboma. So the fending lens is removed and a little bit of vitrectomy is done. And this is the four claw lens we have been talking about. This is inserted through a five millimeter incision. It is held with a Clayman forceps or a vertical forceps and RS is engaged with the tip of the needle and enclaved through the claw. So, so now the two claws have been fixed. Now it is time for the third claw to be fixed. So we usually use a 27 gauge needle through a stab in CN given with a 0.8 diamond blade. It is held with a Clayman forceps and this is the third claw which is being fixed. Then IOL but a IOL device. It will help in interior chamber reconstruction also. So in this case, we are pulling the iris, edge of the coloboma iris, and we are enclaving it in four claw, and this will do little bit of pupilloplasty as well. So care is taken not to enclave the edge of the iris, but the flat surface of the iris. So now all the four claws are fixed. This lens does not exhibit any pseudofecotinesis. So there is time for doing interior vitrectomy to clear off the interior vitreous which has so many opacities and care is taken when the vitrector probe is withdrawn it should not. So I think it's a bad neuroinnovation by Dr. Kiranji Singh. Dr. Mohan Rajan is busy in OPL so he said excuse me. We are just going to play his video only, but no more. A nickel time saves nine. Just to show you a medicinal, a blue or a green injector, I'm trying to put in an Invistar lens. But what is happening is the training haptic is getting caught in the space between the silicon plunger and the cartridge wall. If you try to remove that or pull it out, that can be damaged to the haptic and you need to explant the lens. There's another patient who's had an in-focus lens and you can see how I'm trying to do the implantation of the lens with a medicinal green injector. There's nothing wrong with the lens, but you can see the trailing haptic is again caught in the space between the plunger and the cartridge wall. I just use a seven blade, 11 blade to open up the space, to open up the cartridge. This is called ocular episotomy. Once I make a nick on the cartridge, there is more space for the haptic to be released and the rest of the problem gets solved easily without any deformation of the haptic or the optic. You can see just to demonstrate an hydrophilic lens using a medicinal green injector. How the trailing haptic is getting caught and getting trapped and I'm doing a ocular episotomy again, opening up the cartridge with the 11 blade and you see beautifully the, the haptic gets released very nicely without any damage to the haptic or the optic. So this is a very simple method, very elegant method of taking care of the problem. This problem is more common than what you can imagine and it can take you by surprise at the end of the implantation and 
very common in green or the blue medicinal injectors. The take home message is a nick and time saves nine. Ocular episotomy is the way to go. So I think medicinal is uh, some problem. Yeah. Most of the cases occur with that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, this hydrophilic lenses. Yes. So uh, next we are going to have Dr. Naina T. Shivmoga with us. She is going to present IOL scaffolding in Morgagini in Cataract. Greetings everyone. Here we describe IOL scaffolding technique for phaco emulsification in case of a hypermature Morgagni in cataract. After clear corneal incision, anterior lens capsule is stained with trip and blue. Doing rexus in case of a hypermature cataract is challenging. Connecting cystitome with an irrigation fluid line makes the rexus easier as it maintains the anterior chamber and improves the view for the rexus by pushing the liquefied cortex out of the anterior chamber through the tunnel. Now we are injecting viscoelastic to create some space in the bag. Foldable IOL is being implanted below the nucleus in the bag. Nucleus is small in this case, so it is easy to implant IOL below the nucleus. During nuclear emulsification, viscoelastic needs to be injected repeatedly to protect the corneal endothelium. IOL here acts as a scaffold and prevents dangling of the nucleus and hence prevents any posterior capsular rupture. Further, IOL scaffolding keeps the bag distended and prevents any inadvertent zonular dehiscence. Important aspect to be followed in this case is to perform cortex and viscoaspiration below the IOL to avoid entrapment of the liquefied cortex between the IOL and the posterior capsule. Viscoaspiration is being followed by wound hydration. IOL scaffolding ensures safety in performing phacoemulsification in Morgagni and cataract. Thank you. So what you think it's the, uh, uh, what was the need of IOL scaffold in this? So usually the when okay. that uh, we can manage with the uh, viscoelastic. It's it's make it a little more safer, I think. It's but you, it will decrease the space, yes. working space, and you are close to the endothelium. And that is true, sir. But uh, in this case, this was a hypermature cataract. Uh, so, in the uh, when we when we try to attempt a phaco emulsification in this case, it is possible that uh, the nucleus might become vertical, and may, we might catch the uh, capsule inadvertently, and uh, PCR chances are also more. So, once I injected the uh, foldable IOL, the uh, phaco emulsification was more stable. But it is true that uh, endothelium, uh, corneal endothelium, has to be taken care of. Uh, so, dispersive viscoelastic always helps and uh, this is a safer technique in case of hypermature cataracts. What about the irrigating cystitome? How did you design that? Uh, it is just a regular 26 kg needle with uh, which we have made the cystitome. We are just connecting it to the irrigation line. Irrigation? No. Irrigation line, ma'am. Just how, how we do uh, cortex aspiration. Machine. Not the FACO machine, manual, uh, manual. manual irrigation. Just but a drip. It's just I a drip, like is, a drop by drop. That is something very useful, yes, I think. Yes. Useful. Useful. In <laughs> such a, a morgagnin cataract, leaking important. cataracts, I think. That is yes. more useful. But you would from the main yeah. main port. Uh, main, in, main incision port. It's uh, difficult to maintain the space. Uh, if yes. you do it by side, uh, side, side port, port it, yes. it will be much easier. Yes. And you can have an AC maintainer also. Yes. I think that works the same uh, way. Well, it, work, yeah. it will work the same. Uh, what she's trying, what she's trying to say, that you have a hypermature uh, morganian sclerotic cataract and uh, you know it's like a wobbly nucleus which is small and then you fill up the bag and the protective uh, posterior, posterior caps mm -hmm. scaffold, mm -hmm. iron scaffold and then you go ahead with the procedure. Yeah. So you have enough space, reasonable space and you are safe enough not to go here and there. The nucleus, wobbly nucleus can actually move up to so, but then again, you know, going behind the IOL, giving a wash and everything, you can still, uh, you know, get the PC into trouble. Yeah. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. So we are moving to the next talk, Dr. Pradeep Sagar, the detective. Hello everyone, this video is about a detective, a 62 year old gentleman presented with recurrent retinal detachment 10 days following silicon oil removal. He was posted for revision surgery. We could not identify the causative break even after thorough screening of retina. Injection of perfluorocarbon liquid over the posterior pole resulted in ballooning of the peripheral retina. We are worried how to proceed further. Then we remember what our mentor said about a detective. A detective which is always available around the corner. A detective which is good at detecting the hidden culprits. It's none other than the brilliant blue dye. BBG was injected into the subretinal space transclerally with 26 gauge needle. Few moments later, the detective had done its job. A trace of dye into the vitreous cavity was seen through a tiny hole at 6 o'clock position. PFCL assisted fluid air exchange was performed through the break. Laser photocoagulation was performed around the break. C3FA was used as tamponade agent. The take home message of this video is subretinal PBG injection can be used to identify the hidden breaks. It can also be used in the eyes with lack of contrast such as pathological myopia and coloboma. Let's give a big round of applause to our detective. Are there some contraindication for BBG? Okay, um, question says sorry. Huh? What is the I contraindication he is asking? Any contraindication? Contraindication where you want, don't want to inject. Subretinal, mm. is, is there any contraindication, any toxicity or anything that you are worried about? Uh, like, uh, as such, like there is not much of uh, uh, like literature in re regarding the toxicity, toxicity with subretinal injection. We use it regularly in the intra, in the vitreous cavity. But there is one animal study in a POSIN model like which has compared ICG versus uh, BBG and uh, TRAMPS and loans subretinal, after subretinal injection. And they noted that like uh, with ICG there was a definite toxicity to the RP and photoreceptor but with uh, ICG, with the BBG and uh, TRAMPS and loans there was not much. So it's well known that like uh, BBG can lead to uh, a toxicity but uh, it is uh, a safer drug compared to a safer dye compared to the rest of the like other drug particularly ICG. What is new about this? This has been reported. Uh, yeah, this has been reported like even in the first report is somewhere in 2007 and uh, then one more in 2020 but uh, combined like it's just around eight cases case series. So it's something which is well known but uh, not practiced often. So most often we end up doing a 360 degree laser and to be safe we end up putting oil but rather than that it's always better to identify a break. That's so the advantage here was that you didn't need to re-inject oil? Yeah, I was pretty much sure that what is the cause of this uh, recurrent detachment so I can end up, I, I can close the case without uh, need for an oil. That was the advantage. But it was uh, adjacent uh, to the pre-existing break, right? The yeah, primary break, it was, break. It it was, was very close yeah, to the primary It was break. adjacent to the, it was a case with multiple HSTs. So like it was the adjacent to one of the uh, previous laser scar. Do you think it was a missed break? Yes. From it, the first, it's, it's quite possible that it can be a mistake. Even that's possible, sir. Thank you, thank you so much. So the next speaker is Dr. Raghav Pritham. He is going to speak on uh, Desmectopexy uh, Plus, a novel technique for incurred desmet membrane. Hello everyone, welcome to today's video on Desmetopexy Plus, a novel technique for incurled Desmet's membrane detachment. A 57 year old gentleman who had undergone cataract surgery 3 weeks ago presented with vision of 2200 on examination had large DMD along the vertical axis with curling of the DM at the superior edge 
which can be confirmed on the anterior segment OCT as well and the IOL is pretty stable. Let us now look at the surgical video. To begin with, epithelial debridement is done and orientation of DMD is assessed. Due to the overlying stromal edema, details of the inward scroll are not very clear. We use an external light pipe to assess the DM position. As can be seen here, the margins of the scroll can be well demarcated with the inward fold can be made out. Then a side port is made and saline injected into the AC. Jets of fluid are injected and mechanical debridement is attempted. However, DM fails to unscroll. So the globe is made relatively hypotonous and our technique of single cannula unscrolling technique is attempted. Side port is made perpendicular to the long axis of the scroll. Then the orientation of the scroll is rechecked using a light pipe. Using a Sinsky hook, side port is gently depressed and multiple taps are being pushed over the center of the cornea. DM unscrolls as can be seen and confirmed with a light pipe. And then finally air bubble is injected and a full chamber air fill is achieved and left in situ. On day 1 post-op, DM is well attached and half chamber air bubble can be noted. On one week the vision improved to 20-40 and DM is well attached and stromal edema cleared up which is confirmed on the anterior segment OCT as well. To summarize we have the case of Desmet's detachment with enrolling of the endothelial cells towards the stroma. By decompressing the globe and by using multiple thrusts, by creating the turbulence from center to the periphery, we helped to unscroll the curled in DM and using air, it was kept in position. Thank you. So putting an air injection alone will not suffice uh, if so we have the proper orientation yes, of curling and everything. Yeah. Good evening everyone. So. Uh, that was a very important question. Thank you, sir, for that. So the whole reason why I put it up is because the DM is scrolled inwards towards the stroma. The moment you try injecting an air inside, it just gets attached in that position itself. It doesn't unscroll by its own and goes back to position. And I also demonstrated why we had to do this because we tried to manually separate it, use the fluid to separate it and it was not separating. It was three weeks past cataract surgery. There is some amount of fibrosis which comes there which is holding it in position. So this is a maneuver because of the recent advances in performing the DMEC surgery with which we have got more knowledge about the in uh, the eddy currents which go inside the eye. So using that knowledge to use in a routine DMD post cataract surgery, we could uh, save, save the cornea here. So uh, one thing is that uh, we, we we, we should have tried the simple way what uh, Dr. Vinod was also saying. Uh, if you would have tried that and if, if you would have failed that way, then I think this is, uh, this uh, is uh, fine. So uh, there is always the a chance that once you uh, inject the air, the air can enter into the pocket of separation and can just increase the DMD as well. So that's another threat because uh, there is a good enough space there and also the curling inside. Either the curling can get fixed onto the stroma or the air might escape into the space leading to much more DMD making the whole configuration even more complex. So we didn't want to do that. We understood the anatomy first. We tried to separate it anatomically structure by structure and attach it in the current orientation. That was the idea. Uh, How old was it was three weeks old. Uh, so th that's the beauty of it, ma'am. So once you get the orientation right, it's the patient's natural DM. Its uh, original position is to stick to the stroma. So you don't need extra gas, C3, F8, anything. The plain air itself will suffice the attachment. Given that you are putting it in the right position from which it got stripped. So uh, can you visualize the curling during the surgery so we can't visualize it with the microscope that's exactly why we got our uh, light probe from the uh, you have to use the endo illuminator uh, endo illuminator again uh, the ha hands to work on becomes less yeah, so, so this is an external light pipe which the retina friends use yeah that's what endo illuminator yeah. so endo, the endo illuminator, illuminator from the external, external side. Yeah. so that's what yeah. i'm saying in fact so, i've seen a case like this where um, um, the uh, gas was injected on this curly dm and which didn't get unrolled and it was a nightmare to reopen it i will say very nicely managed actually 
so you know but the trick here is you have to decide on table whether this curl is getting released or not getting released correct it has to be definitely visualized yeah. and the endo eliminator helps doing endo eliminator really yeah helps. it works brilliantly yeah. endo eliminator with the room lights off this yeah. was uh, dr praveen krishna yes yes hmm. you should acknowledge Yes, sir. I've given the name. The so, slide, yeah, I've given it in the slide. Yeah. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. So, the next present is Dr. Suchitra Kumari Biswal. She's going to speak, never belittle the classic. Hello, everyone. This video is about rediscovering the classic, which is fading away. A 43-year-old lady presented with diminution of vision in right time. Her best corrected visual acuity was 6 by 12. The anterior segment examination was normal. Fender's examination showed retinal pigment abnormalities at the center of the fovea with a neurosensory detachment. The optical coherence tomography showed presence of neurosensory detachment, flat irregular PEDs, packy vessels beneath the PED. Cross section OCT angiography showed flow signal within the PED and the N-phase OCT angiography showed the vascular network. So we made a diagnosis of pachycoroid neovasculopathy. But we had a query in our mind, is the neovascular network really the cause of subretinal fluid? So we decided to go back to the time-tested classic that is fundus fluorescein angiography looking for an answer. Smokestack click was seen on fundus fluorescein angiography. The smokestack leak confirmed the diagnosis of central serous chorioretinopathy. The final diagnosis was CSC with focal leak with quiescent PNV. We went ahead with focal laser of the leaky point at one month, significant reduction in SRF was seen and at two months, complete resolution was seen. So, our good old FFA worked like a charm. In the era of advanced imaging, the use of FFA is decreasing. In the eyes with coexistent pachycoroid diseases, SRF can be due to CSE or from neovascular network. FFA helps in identifying the source of leak in such conditions. But it was still a juxtafovia leak, isn't it? Uh, yes, sir. I will be a little wary of doing laser. <laughs> yeah, too close. But very nicely managed and very nicely thought of. You know, normally most of us are getting away with invasive angiographies nowadays. Uh, angio OCT, yes, sir. Definitely <laughs> got carried away. But definitely FFA ICG really changes, uh, still changes the game, uh, you know, and thinking point in all these patients. The only thing is that if at all we would have considered focal laser, I would have preferred a yellow laser. So, but definitely green laser I would have avoided. That was my take, but anyway, very nicely managed. Yeah. Yes. It does work, it does work. Yeah, just a juxtafovial to subfovial leak actually. Yeah, so that's. Observation is still the treatment, sir. First line of treatment and control the other factors, stress. So and but, other, other co the duration of this is was about four months, sir. So. In fact, we are treating an ophthalmologist with multifocal. The fluid comes, fluid goes. The moment you tell him relax for two, three months, he comes. <laughs> Just a juxtafavial leak, same thing like this. And he has been seen by many ophthalmologists. Everyone says a different treatment. But still, uh, this kind of fluids can be observed, sir. It just goes off on its own faster. So we have to be patient. The, the, the patients are not patient. That is what is a crime. They want immediate. The first picture, it looks more like a chronic persistent. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. Sir, the, the, yeah. No, no, correct on this, sir. Point well taken. No, but when we see a PNV, sir, I noticed that PNVs respond very well to the injection. Patients are also happy with respect to their vision quality. Chronic 
So old is not always gold. <laughs> we have to remember. Sir, so, but it's always yeah, but, best. But some classics, they always will be there. Yes, yes. They will be always there. Yeah, In so, era of so much advancement may be there. So uh, the thing is, if you don't want to do an invasive uh, test for every single patient, this is a good indicator to tell us to do it or not to do. Like, you know, everybody, first of all, doesn't have access right. to either ICG or to Okta. So it's a little worrying in that. But anyway, nice. And Thank just you. to add on, uh, we have done many patients like this in the past with low flow and PDT. So, so they respond very well. So uh, that, that uh, PDT is not we, there, yeah. but sooner yeah. it's going to be available again. So that option has to be kept in, kept in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. So we have Dr. Manisha Garwal here. Uh, Dr. Saiban. Sir, she's coming. I just spoke. So she's on. She'll come. Manisha on the way. Dr. Manish. Saiban. Manisha is not here, sir. She is the winner of the first session. Achha. So we just invited her to have her also to present the talk. Oh. So anyway, if she has not come, but we can wait for Dr. Saiban. Meanwhile, she is on the way. I hope so, sir, because uh, she was in an IC. Maybe she is talking, but I have told Aditya. I think he will tell her to come. Okay. So this was the first time we had uh, two minutes to win in AIOC. Earlier we had in state conference in IIRSI, the concept was much appreciated and uh, in a two minutes it's much easier to give a tip. Of course, you can't give a whole surgery and in the era of 2020, most of the person wants to have a short tip given in a short time. So, the take home message uh, given in a short time makes it uh, very interesting. I think I am open to suggestions how we can further improve. Big, big round of applause to you, sir, for getting the <laughs> concept. <you. laughs> and, and also reminding everyone time and time again that you have to come for this session. That is also very important. <laughs> <laughs> so this time we got around 100 plus entries. Wow. And it was tough to shortlist them. So we selected 14, these 14 entries you are seeing here. Then I got a call from Chairman Scientific that we got one slot more and uh, can you utilize that one? I say why not we have got 100 entries. So we had another 9 entries on that one. So total 23 entries were adjusted in two sessions. So the winners, uh, you know, you should probably collate all the winning videos and send it to all the members. Sir. Yes, yes. Uh, I'll try to put in a YouTube yeah. and uh, that will be accessible to Almost all yeah, persons. Send the members because you've been conducting. And these. meanwhile, if you wish, you can announce the best of best. No, uh, but we'll we have to calculate it. Pardon? We're waiting for Saiban. Okay, okay. So we'll wait for another two, three minutes. Yes, sir. If she doesn't come, then. The undulating movements of the cyst were well appreciated on throwing the light to stain the posterior hyaloid face. Posterior vitreous detachment was induced using active suction from the vitrectomy cutter. A 41 gauge cannula was then used to inject the saline in the submacular space. Simultaneously, perfluorocarbon liquid bubble was injected over the optic nerve head. Some more saline was injected through the 41 gauge cannula and some more perfluorocarbon liquid was injected and the size of the bubble increased. As the cyst moved towards the opening of the 41 gauge cannula, a beautiful foveal reflex could be well appreciated. It appeared like the cyst was moving towards the 41 gauge cannula opening. A soft tip cannula was then used to take out the cyst into the vitreous cavity. The cyst was delivered using a soft tip cannula. The cyst was then eaten away using the vitrectomy cutter. This was followed by fluid air exchange and laser was done. This was then followed by exchange of air with 20% of SF6 tamponade. At 6 months follow up, the patient recovered a vision of 6, 12 and 9 in the left eye. So change continues. Change karke. You for another three four minutes. It's modified 
MIGS she is going to present This video describes a new technique of modified mix wherein two trabecular bypass procedures have been combined to attain effective IOP reduction in traumatic glaucoma A 37 year old patient sustained blunt injury with a cricket ball 2 months ago His visual acuity was 6 by 6 but had chronic IOP elevation of 60 mm of mercury in spite of maximum anti glaucoma medications including mannitol and even paracentesis His optic nerve head was normal and so were the visual fields and RNFL OCT. He had angle recession in the superior quadrant. Chronic IOP elevation post blunt trauma has been attributed to damage and fibrosis of the trabecular meshwork and collapse of the Schlem's canal both of which decrease the aqueous outflow. Here I have combined an eye stent inject implant with a limited bent ab internal needle goniectomy. The eye stent serves to bypass the damaged trabecular meshwork and is placed 3 clock hours apart. Limited bang is then performed for 2 clock hours in between the two stents. The rationing behind this is to whisper dilate and expand the Schlem's canal behind and around the stents so as to facilitate the outflow. outcome of this technique is still to be assessed but achieving this whopping decline in intraocular pressure without having to deal with the potential risks complicated follow up regime and longer recovery time and yet sparing the conjunctiva for any future filtration surgery was a blessing for this young patient here you see two well placed stents and a well dilated schlem's canal were no complications encountered and the patient's post op intraocular pressure was 10 mm of mercury on two anti glaucoma medications so what is the carry home message you are trying to tell so first of all i really want to apologize for being late i was stuck in an uh, ic and thank you so much for waiting thank you so much for the opportunity so now uh, this case uh, what is novel in this case is that let's remember this is a young patient a 30 year old patient who had a pressure of 60 mm of mercury so the only option one uh, thinks of is trabeculectomy in this patient which uh, nowadays becomes uh, sounds like a very aggressive treatment because this is an ocular hyper intensive he does not have any glaucomatous damage so now with the introduction of mix in our surgical armamentarium we are able to give them uh, that benefit of saving them from uh, the trabe uh, trabeculectomy and also bringing down the uh, iop reduction which the anti glaucoma medications cannot what is different about is uh, this case is that i've combined uh, two mix procedures which have normally been done separately Uh, and why i did this was uh, that repeatedly i was seeing if one procedure fails you jump in to do another mix procedures now i stent and bang both they have their own demerits i stent takes a little because these are really tiny uh, devices it takes a long time for the aqueous to flow in through this and the schlem's canal to expand so it takes a while and uh, leaving a pressure of 60 giving them the window of taking 2 3 months for the pressure to stabilize was not really fair to the patient the demerit with bang which is uh, trabecular stripping is the fact that Uh, let's say after two to three months, they do develop some sort of peripheral anterior sinusae because this is not a very sophisticated stripping of the trabecular meshwork, so it seals back. Uh, now, when that happens, of course, the IOP rises. So now, rather than doing eye stent and later on, if that fails or takes time, doing a bang or vice versa, what we did was we combined the two procedures, saved the patient from a trabeculectomy and also maybe another mix procedure if that was required. give them the benefit that bang will immediately drop down the iop because there is a large at least a, um, let's say 50 to 60 degrees of communication of the aqueous into the schlem's canal and uh, even if it seals later on uh, a few months down the line the stents by then would have kicked in so that is the advantage that we've given and i have a follow up of 8 uh, months with this patient with the pressure is maintained at 15 mm of mercury with uh, four uh, anti glaucoma medications um, was it a case of angle recession yes sir how much so angle recession was about 90 degrees the entire uh, superior quadrant and a little bit of little more than 90 degrees the target area of mix is always nasal and that angle is sped 
Of course, it would not have been attempted if the angle recession was in the nasal uh, hemisphere and if that's where the bang was to be performed, it could not have been done. Because it should be done away from. Yes, yes. So it was superior, the angle recession and the treatment area was nasal. Thank you. Thank you. A portable diffuse illumination and image capturing device. There are various capturing devices in the market. None of them are cost effective, especially for 1800 residents who pass out every year. The need of the hour is a portable, cheap, easy to use device. Thus, we came up with MobiLamp. The MobiLamp is a 3D printed device and we used I think the judges have reached the conclusion. We have we have ready, sir. So, so we have two winners from this session. Yes. So I'll request to announce uh, two win winners. name of the winners here. Uh, the Second. runner up is uh, uh, Dr. G. S. Dhami, and the winner is Dr. Arun Kumar Jain. Oh, okay. It is decided. Amongst all of us, all, that's, three, that's all five of us. Yeah, that's important. So congratulations to all the winner. And with this, I think we should close. And I should thank my honorable judges, Dr. Devashi sir, Dr. Naina Potedar, Dr. Chaitra, Dr. Manoj. Purendra Basin and Manoj. And Dr. Basin sir. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, sir. A big thank round you, of applause to for you, sir. Yeah.